In a short time, one man has accomplished everything from music to acting. He's saved lives and given life, and he's been a roller coaster ride both professionally and personally. Whether he's on or off stage, T.I. is quickly making a name for himself. On September 25th, 1980, a baby boy named Clifford Joseph Harris Jr. was brought into this world. This tiny little being would later become known to the music world as the rapper T.I. Hailing from Atlanta, Georgia, T.I. was destined to become a rap star. Not only was it significant in his culture and society, but his uncles were into it as well. T.I. started rapping for fun and just to make some noise but his uncles were so impressed by his talent that he just kept at it. Practice obviously made perfect. The more he did it, the better he got. And the better he got, there was no stopping him. Rap music was definitely his calling. T.I. went through quite a few nicknames and stage names. Before settling on T.I., he went by Tip, T.I.P., and Rubber Band Man, which came from his former association as a dope boy. If Tip and T.I.P. sound too close together, there's a reason for that. His original stage name, T.I.P., came from his childhood nickname, Tip. Due to his southern accent, fans mistakenly thought he was calling himself Chip. As a result, he began spelling it out, T.I.P. The best name in life for T.I., it had to be T.I. because it's like, that's the name he used now for like his peak of his career. It's, it's kind of fit him, but I kind of like the rubber band man too, cause the um, rubber band man. One time, I, in one of the interviews, I heard him said uh, the rubber band around his wrist represent the struggle before all the bling and the bling blow. I think Ti is the best name. It's short to the point, and people remember it. So why does he call himself Ti? After signing with Arista Records in 2001, he shortened his name to Ti out of respect for another musician. Tip was too similar to his label mate's name, Q-Tip. Whether he's going by T.I., T.I.P., or Tip, he's as unique as his music. People got a taste of T.I. from his 2001 debut album, I'm Serious. Pharrell Williams of the Neptunes, who referred to T.I. as the Jay-Z of the South, Jazzy Fay, and Youngbloods all lended their voices to the album. Despite help from these notables, the album did not do very well, forcing Arista Records to drop him from their label. That didn't stop T.I. from reaching his musical dreams. He formed Grand Hustle Records and released several mixtapes. With the help of DJ Drama, the tapes got a lot of underground buzz. In the summer of 2003, T.I. resurfaced on Bone Crusher's song, Never Scared. He parlayed this attention toward the release of his second album, Trap Music. Trap music solidified T.I.'s music on the streets and on the charts. The album reached the number four spot on the Billboard charts with the hits Be Easy, Rubber Band Man, and Let's Get Away. But the celebration came to a halt. T.I. was sentenced to jail for a probation violation. Luckily, he was granted work release to finish recording his third album. In 2004, T.I. released Urban Legend. The album proved to be an instant hit, debuting at number 7 on the Billboard 200. It instantly generated crossover success with the hit single, Bring Em Out. On this album, T.I. set himself apart from other rappers from the South. He managed to paint the real picture of Southern inner city living that so many of his colleagues have failed to do. Of course, this album had a little help. Some of the artists featured on Urban Legend include Nelly, Manny Fresh, Lil Wayne, and Lil' Kim. While many of his fellow musicians fell into the trap of valuing style over substance, T.I. managed to rise above it on this album. He told a series of stories with amazing lyrics throughout the entire record. T.I. also paid homage to hip hop's East Coast roots. He rapped over a sample of Run DMC's classic, King of Rock, where he gave fans a glimpse into his mind. He explained why he's so cocky in the lyrics, I came, I saw, I conquered, with no big name, no fame, no celebrity sponsors. 
on the final track, My Life, which features West Coast rapper Daz Dillinger, T.I. showed listeners his ability to adapt to an entirely different style of hip-hop. But like any album, it did have its flaws. One critic said, some of the songs lacked the fire of T.I.'s first album, I'm Serious, and the maturity of his sophomore effort, Trap Music. One of the tracks he's referring to is Limelight. Even though PSC Click member Big Country's vocals complemented the song nicely and the chorus was acceptable, he thought the song in its entirety was quite lackluster. Another flaw was that T.I. fell short on a number of subjects. He constantly referred to people hating on him throughout the album, but after a certain point it became too redundant, leaving fans wanting more. Despite the few flaws, overall, Urban Legend was a definite buy. It spawned smash hits like Bring Em Out and the Grammy-nominated You Don't Know Me. T.I.'s fourth album, King, moved off shelves as quickly as it came. It hit stores in March 2006 and sold over 520,000 copies in its first week. It also debuted at number one on the Billboard 200. Even mobile provider Sprint was getting in on the action. They partnered with TI to offer images, downloads, and exclusive ringers even before King's release date. In April 2006, TI was Sprint's featured artist of the month. Three unreleased tracks, along with his instrumentals for What You Know and Ride With Me, were made available, along with full music videos for video-enabled phones. Why the sudden interest from Sprint? Because T.I.'s previous album, Urban Legend, proved popular with Sprint customers. More than a million music tones were downloaded from that album. But all that praise and recognition about King wasn't enough to keep T.I. smiling. He felt like he was still playing catch up. He had mixed feelings because he felt that his career should have taken off in 2001 with the release of his first album, I'm Serious. He said, I feel like I should have had Nelly's or Fiddy's career. I should have dropped and debuted at number one and went hard from the top. But God don't make mistakes and I don't regret none of the things I went through. I, I like King of the South. And that's my favorite album from T.I. I think it's tough to make an impact with your first album anyways. And where he's, he's a southern rapper, a lot of people weren't really paying attention to rap coming out of the south until recently. So it makes sense that he, with his third album, he got popular, but the earlier albums were kind of under the radar. To me personally, I, I felt T.I. on the album before this one. The album before this one, but he wrote, he wrote this whole album off this single we just had, and then he dropped another single with the female. Why you want it? But nah, T.I., five to 10 years, it's gonna be who? Who, what, and where? Me, right now, from the South and where he coming from? Nah, he fell off this album. This album was whack, point blank, period. He had two hits. The album before this was running with a couple of songs. I could play, 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 skip. Now I'm skip, skip, play, skip, 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 play, play, and that's it. So I don't see him nowhere in five to 10 years. And PSC, that's a, here today, going tomorrow, whole click. Nah, for real. I ain't even famous yet, and I'm feeling myself better than them, so I feel them know he was out. I like the music, I like the, uh, how, the, the way he performed on the song, you know. He was underrated then, Urban Legend, but then he came back with this one, and like, nah, he rolled it off with that, what you know about that single, and that was it. To y'all, he's he now earned his place in the music business, because like the first album he did, it's like he had to like kind of pay his dues to be up there with the 50 Cents and the Snoop Dogg. So I, I believe he, he paid his dues now. He's been, he been on his job. The second single from King, Why You Wanna, may be familiar to dance enthusiasts. T.I. used a sample from Crystal Waters' hit, Gypsy Woman. T.I. said that he couldn't take any credit for that sample. It was actually one of his producers at Grand Hustle who introduced him to the track. As soon as he started playing Gypsy Woman, everyone in the room started singing along. That's when T.I. knew he had to put it on his album. It's no wonder King did so well. One reviewer said that the album showed maturity. Even T.I. wanted it to be his best work. He said that everything he thought he could have done different in his other albums, 
he did on King. What was his secret? Not only did he do it differently, he did it better. If his fans listen carefully, they may realize that some of the songs from his previous three releases were reincarnated and mutated into something better. For those who liked You Don't Know Me, for which T.I. received a Grammy nomination for Best Solo Rap Performance, T.I. gave them not one, but two songs, Top Back and I'm Straight. Those who enjoyed Praying for Help, again, T.I. came up with two better versions, Good Life and Living in the Sky. What do you know, the first single from King became the number one most added track at both CHR Rhythmic and Urban Radio stations nationwide. The video to the song features cameos by actor Mike Epps and Travis Barker of Blink-182. It was directed by Chris Robinson, who also directed T.I. in his acting debut in the Warner Brothers film, ATL. The video shows a day in the life of T.I where he attends the premiere of ATL, joins the film's cast in the theater, and then attends the after party. Most of the music from King had people singing, but the track, I'm Talking to You, had a lot of people talking. There was a lot of chat rooms on the internet dedicated to the song. Fans were trying to figure out exactly who T.I. was dissing, if anyone. Some speculated that it was more of a general warning because otherwise, T.I. would have been more upfront about it. They said that if he did have a problem with somebody specific, he would straight out say their name. But T.I. put the speculations to rest. He told reporters that he didn't have anyone specific in mind. He was really just talking about anyone who represents fakeness. He also said that it's really about things that go on day to day throughout his life that most people have no idea about. And why should he mention a specific person that no one knows? It doesn't really make any sense. All in all, the album was highly praised for T.I.'s sincerity in delivering his rags to riches story. While other musicians spend much of their albums giving an inventory of their materialistic possessions, T.I. avoided that trap. If you're yearning for more songs on King, check out the mixtape, The Leak. T.I. had to drop two of the original songs from his fourth album because they were leaked on the internet right before the album's release. You can find both songs along with new tracks on his mixtape. King might be T.I.'s latest album, but hopefully it won't be his last. Whether it's breaking up with your first boyfriend or girlfriend, or moving out of your parents' house to live in an exciting new city, it's never easy to say goodbye. But when your best friend and confidant leaves you forever, it's the hardest thing you ever have to go through. Unfortunately, on Wednesday, May 3rd, 2006, T.I. had to do just that. His longtime childhood friend and personal assistant, 26-year-old Philant Johnson, was killed in a gun battle in Cincinnati, Ohio. Witnesses told police that a fight began at a post-performance party for T.I. and fellow rapper Young Jock at Club Ritz. A dispute with locals broke out, so T.I. and his entourage decided to leave the party. But it didn't seem to matter. Two dark-colored SUVs pursued T.I. and his crew, and a gun battle ensued. That was the beginning of the end for one of T.I.'s crew. His best friend, Philant Johnson was pronounced dead at the Cincinnati hospital several hours later. Luckily, T.I. didn't suffer any injuries, but three others from his group did. A 22-year-old woman from Minnesota was hospitalized but in stable condition, while a 40-year-old bodyguard and a driver were treated and released. T.I. told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that he wasn't sure what sparked the fight that ended his friend's life. All he knew was that some party goers at Club Ritz were enraged just because someone threw money at the audience members during a set by Young Jock. A witness told the Cincinnati Enquirer that the money was for the ladies, but the money accidentally hit some men in the face. The men took offense to this because they thought, we got money, so why are they throwing money at us? T.I. and his crew decided to leave to avoid a scene. They got into the van where T.I. sat in the back row on the driver's side and Johnson sat in the row in front of him. As the van headed towards the highway, shots rang out, hitting Johnson and three others. 
Officers responded to reports of the shooting at approximately 3 in the morning on southbound Interstate 75, one of the two main roads that leads to Cincinnati's downtown. Once the van stopped on the highway, T.I. helped carry his friend into another car that transported them to the hospital where he was pronounced dead a few hours later. The shooting led to the closing of the southbound lanes of I-75 during the morning rush hour as police investigated the three-mile-long crime scene. The road didn't reopen until 10 a.m. that morning. Days after the incident, T.I. still had long red scratches across the back of his left shoulder from the glass that shattered when it was hit by bullets. What's interesting is that community leaders and police asked the Cincinnati City Council to close down Club Ritz in April 2005 after several incidents at the club. Unfortunately, the council members voted against it. Two months after the request was denied in June 2005, three people were shot in front of the club after a fight took place outside. The owner of the club said that he would close the bar until he could resolve security problems and guarantee the presence of enough paid police and security officers. According to witnesses, there were plenty of law enforcement officers at the club when the incident occurred. So how was it that the gun battle still went on after the club's owners promised to get more officers? No one knows. Unfortunately, Fallant Johnson's death wasn't the end of the gun battle. The Cincinnati Police Department feared that a possible retaliation shooting may have been in the works. They increased their uniformed and undercover patrols in the area around Club Ritz. Their fears stemmed from information they received from various sources. They said that out-of-town people, possibly from Atlanta, were in town to carry out attacks in honor of T.I.'s best friend. So far, no vengeful incidents have occurred. Young Jock set the record straight about the unfortunate shooting. He went on Atlanta's radio station, V103FM, hosted by Ryan Cameron, and told listeners that T.I. was a peacemaker in the incident and tried to defuse the situation. He said that T.I. had absolutely nothing to do with the violence. T.I. told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in his first interview since the gun battle that the death of Fallant Johnson forced him to reevaluate his own life and career. He said that he could never forget the final moments of his best friend's life. I told him that I had him and it was going to be all right. And he said, all right. A few short hours later, Johnson passed away. I'm kind of like watching my life change right before my eyes. I'm figuring out whether or not I even want to keep doing this stuff right now. T.I. told the paper that he didn't think he and Johnson had to live like that anymore. He thought that stuff was over for them. They had both overcome life on the streets and felt like life was getting better. And then the shooting happened. T.I. also said, I'm not ever going to be the same. Success isn't measured in money, it's measured in happiness. Peace. And I ain't at peace right now. And I ain't happy. My partner's gone. Nothing could replace his friend. But hopefully T.I. knows that his friend would want him to move on. It wasn't enough that T.I. had to watch his best friend die. But he had to relive the experience. T.I. addressed approximately 600 people at Fallant Johnson's funeral service in Atlanta. Flowers and photos of Johnson framed his casket, which was open for a final viewing before the ceremony. He stumbled over his words as he stood over Johnson's midnight blue casket and tried to describe losing his best friend. He said it was the toughest speech he's ever had to make. I've held a microphone at many concerts and other situations, but I never had to do anything this hard before. For my partner, I ain't even going to focus on no negativity family forever, and I love you. T.I. remembered how they grew up together. He and Johnson were friends since nursery school. They often spent the night at each other's houses as children. As teenagers, they played video games, and like many high school boys, they got into all sorts of trouble. They caused havoc by breaking windows and running around in someone else's yard. T.I. didn't just deliver the eulogy. He was also among the pallbearers who helped lift the casket onto the black horse-drawn carriage. Other notables who attended the funeral were Atlanta rappers Killer Mike and Young Jock, D. 
DJ Toon, who produced T.I.'s hit single, What You Know, Chris Robinson, who directed T.I. in his first film, ATL, and Warner Music Group president, Kevin Lyles. Also, former American Idol contestant, Kanique Skye, sang at the service. There was a hefty police presence at the funeral. Although police cars and motorcycles lined the street outside the church, and officers stood guard in the church sanctuary, attendees were not searched as they entered the service. It was a beautiful service for a beautiful man. Not all musicians are cut out to be actors, but T.I. has proven he can do both. T.I. made his acting debut in the 2006 low-budget yet highly successful film, ATL. He played the teen role of Rashad, whose character mirrored his own turbulent upbringing. T.I. said that Rashan is a young man who faces a lot of grown man situations. He's trying to find the best way to deal with them and make the right decisions for himself. He's also just trying to create opportunities for his loved ones as well as put them in the best positions possible. After Rashad's parents die, he tries to keep his younger brother, Ant, played by Evan Ross, son of singing sensation Diana Ross, in line. And he tries to make a move on Sexy Nunu, played by actress Lauren London, all while navigating decisions that would determine his life's course. The film spotlights Atlanta's famous Jelly Beans skating rink. The rink was not only a popular hangout for the teenagers in the film, but also for both T.I. and the director when they were teenagers growing up in Atlanta. Truly, I think how I feel, T.I., I seen, I seen his, music, um, his movie, ATL, I think he had longevity in the um, movie career. To me, he's a, um, he's a real great actor. But the music thing, uh, he still got some more dues to pay. To me, ATL, it was a film. I thought that was Rollerblade, Rollerblade 2. That's what I called it, you know. Nah, you know, stick to rapping, man. He was real with that, but he was cool for his first little appearance. Yeah, ATL was a very good movie. It had a lot of uh, uh, good points, trying to take care of his little brother, guide his little brother in the right direction. He was a very good actor. Of course, T.I. brought his passion for music into the film. Songs from his fourth album, King, which included What You Know, Front Back, and Ride With Me were featured in the movie. It's hard to believe but T.I. almost didn't get the part of Rashad. First time filmmaker Chris Robinson, who directed such videos as Snoop Dogg's Beautiful and Fat Joe and Nelly's Get It Poppin', was set on hiring real actors and not any rappers slash actor wannabes. Despite the film's success, it received mixed reviews. One reviewer said the film did not chart new territory. He called it a coming of age story set against the crunk soundtrack. Another reviewer said the movie was recycled. It was similar to the popular flick Boys in the Hood and 2005's Roll Bounce. But it was easy to like the colorful characters, even though the film itself was not an Oscar contender. Still, the movie was worth seeing despite its predictability. It's a solid story that addressed many of the dilemmas facing the African American race. It touched on the rigid class divisions within the black community, the pressures of getting an education, versus the temptation of easy and illegal money, and limited career choices and family responsibilities. Even though the movie got mixed reviews, T.I. did not. Fans can expect to see a lot more of T.I. on the big screen. It's not unusual for musicians to get into trouble with the law. Unfortunately, T.I. has had his share. In April 2004, T.I. was sentenced to three years in prison for violating the terms of his probation from a previous arrest. An arrest warrant was issued in Georgia on December 29, 2003, ordering the revocation of his probation. T.I. turned himself in to county officials on March 30, 2004, and was in custody for quite some time. Fans didn't know what happened to T.I. Rumors were going around that he was hiding out or that he just disappeared. But the truth was, T.I. was in prison. T.I.'s lawyers signed a consent order with prosecutors of Cobb County, Georgia for him to be sentenced right away. This way, he would avoid a formal hearing and save everyone time and money. Jail wasn't fun, but there was some good news. T.I. was able to apply for a work release program after serving at least one year. 
T.I. was originally on probation from a 1998 conviction. He had violated the State Controlled Substance Act and gave false information. After being released on probation, he earned a number of probation violations in several counties around Georgia. Those offenses ranged from possession of a firearm to possession of marijuana. While in prison, T.I. filmed a video at Fulton County Jail in Georgia. Even though he was already serving jail time at a neighboring Cobb County Jail, he received permission to leave his jail cell on work release so he could shoot the video. But Fulton County officials said the shoot was unauthorized, and the deputies who allowed four or five men and a camcorder into the maximum security area of their jail would be reprimanded. T.I. was shooting the video as an introduction to an Atlanta concert that was coming Saturday night. In the video, T.I. appears in the jail cell apologizing to fans for not appearing at the event. During the shoot, an inmate managed to escape from another area of the prison for several hours. Fortunately, he was located and arrested at a gas station. Still, authorities don't believe the escape was related to the video shoot. What doesn't make sense is, why didn't T.I. just shoot the video at his own jail cell? It would have saved him the hassle from commuting. This was just the beginning of T.I.'s legal woes. On January 6, 2005, T.I. pleaded guilty to battery on a law enforcement officer, trespassing, and disorderly conduct in a 2003 incident. The altercation occurred in a Tampa, Florida mall. T.I. and a group of friends were told to leave by security officers after allegedly causing a disturbance. Instead of leaving, T.I. hit one of the officers. He was sentenced to 18 months probation and 75 hours of community service. Two months later, T.I. admitted to violating his probation by driving on a suspended license. As a result, another 150 hours were added by a Florida judge. T.I. was supposed to perform at least five hours a month, but as of April 18, 2006, he only completed 10 hours. On Wednesday, May 10, 2006, a Florida arrest warrant was issued. This time, T.I. was sentenced to an Atlanta jail for failing to perform community service from his 2003 arrest. This came only days after we spoke at a funeral of his best friend and personal assistant, Philant Johnson, who was killed in a gun battle in Cincinnati. Ironically, T.I. was already at an unrelated court hearing in Fulton County, Georgia on the same day. He was accused of starting a fight on New Year's Eve. Fortunately, a judge threw out the case. As T.I. was leaving the courtroom, officials told him of the outstanding Florida warrant. Due to this arrest, T.I. had to cancel a 10-day tour in Japan to promote his latest album, King. T.I.'s lawyer, Dwight Thomas, said the rapper had performed more than 75 hours of community service in Atlanta. Even Georgia officials thought T.I. was meeting his obligations. T.I. was eventually released on $25,000 bail. Let's hope T.I.'s run-ins with the law are over. T.I. certainly has had his share of feuds with other rap artists, specifically with Lil Flip and Ludacris. Apparently, Ludacris made a music video that offended T.I. In the video, a person in a shirt that resembles that of a trap music shirt was being beaten. Whether the resemblance was intentional or not, the feud between T.I. and Ludacris was on. Then, T.I. and Ludacris took their feud to the studio. They recorded a song with G-Unit rapper Young Buck, dissing each other in the second and third verses of the song. Could it be that Young Buck was on Ludacris' side? T.I.'s verse was replaced from the original song listing with The Game. But good news for T.I. and Ludacris fans. The duo settled their dispute in a closed door meeting. Oh, Little Flip and T.I. and Ludacris battle. I think Ludacris, he, he's more lyrical, so he, he probably get, get him over. I, I guess I'll go on Ludacris' side if I had to pick a side. But they all, they all pretty cool. They all got their little skills. They, they do what they do. He killed Flip. Him and, um, him and Ludacris, metaphor. Gotta say, um, gotta say Luda. But like on his gangster, something I bump, I give T.I. that one on that one. Like on that overall, he'll get, he'll win that one. Cause Ludacris, he a real cool guy. He got real metaphors, he can flow. But T.I., gangster, he'll hit you with a flow. 
He'll give it back to you about a bra. He'll hustle. He'll do whatever. Come with that metaphor game. Ludacris got bomb metaphors and little flip. I don't know where he even called himself Freestyle King. I don't even, I don't even know what about him, man. That's it. He's a lyrical rapper. He's a lyrical genius. He has style, character, finesse. I mean, what more can you act, ask for? I mean, me, my, my personal favorite is, is Luda out of those three. Uh, just because I think he's the most talented rapper and he's always, he's always got hot beats. But T.I. still had other scores to settle, such as the one with Lil Flip. When T.I. got out of prison, he heard rumors that Lil Flip had been disrespectful towards him in a show he did in Atlanta. Of course, T.I. felt the need to respond. On a Houston radio station, he made nasty comments about Lil Flip. He said Flip wrongly repped a hood that he didn't grow up in. Now it was Lil Flip's turn to speak, with his fist that is. In an interview with Atlanta radio station 107.9 FM, T.I. confirmed rumors about his fist fight with Lil Flip. The fight occurred in Flip's hometown of Houston, where T.I. was on location shooting the video. But T.I. said that Lil Flip went too far. He claimed that Flip threatened his son on a mixtape. Lil Flip never commented on T.I.'s accusations. But some think it goes way beyond that. Elliot Wilson, editor of the rap magazine XXL, feels T.I. angered other hip-hop artists by calling himself the king of the South. He said, It's two hungry cats trying to take their career to the true star level, but feel like the other is in the way. I don't think T.I. is cocky for calling himself the king of the South because like in the music game you, you got to be cocky somewhat. You can't, you got to let people know, you, you know, you're here to hold us down, you're not here to be playing no games. And it's, it's all part of publicity stunts too. That's what I think. I mean, in the industry, I think you got to be cocky. I mean, you have to be cocky. You have a cocky attitude, cocky mind frame, you know, you got to feel like you're all. I mean, right now, I don't know who else could really compete with him. I mean, if you're just talking number of fans and the album sales. Do I think T.I. the King is out? Um, he up there. He ain't the king to me, but go for it right now. He is like, right now, you, you can call yourself the king, man, you hot, but he ain't never gonna be the king for a G level. He ain't gonna never get that respect. He ain't Scarface. He ain't other guys that's been in the game. <laughs> Well, beat him, battle him, lyrical, and chew him, but he there though. He there, but he ain't he ain't the king of the South. There's too many hot artists right now, and way before him. He's coming off real on the album. He's like, you can you tell he's like giving his all. I'm feeling a lot of songs on that King of the South album. They both claimed to be King of the South, which led to an album created by a Southern DJ called Fight for the Throne. The CD has unreleased songs and freestyle raps of T.I. and Flip slaying words of hate and insulting each other. The CD never hit shelves for music label reasons, but can be downloaded from LimeWire and Kazaa. Just how good is the album? The 32-track CD is a hit in the underground rap world. Some fans thought T.I. took shots at Little Flip on his fourth album, King, on the songs What Do You Know? You Who and I'm talking to you. But in March 2006, T.I. disputed the claim in an interview with popular online magazine HipHopGame.com. He said he and Lil Flip also worked it out in a closed door meeting and there was no longer any beef between the two of them. But not everyone was buying it. Some noticed T.I.'s dislike of Flip in the shoulder lean video. When Young Dro delivered the line, Lucky Charms necklace, nah it ain't Flip, T.I. makes a laughing gesture to the camera. Hopefully, these men can get past their differences and make beautiful music together. No stranger to controversy, T.I. is prepared to take the good with the bad. So when people say they don't like the use of curse words and the n-word in his songs, he doesn't let it bother him. He said he isn't trying to be disrespectful, and he's not intentionally trying to alienate anyone. This is his way of relating to his fans and to get his message across. What message is that? Using the N-word allows him to go back to the hood and give back and influence others, like telling kids to stay in school. He said, if you can't relate to the people you're trying to move, then you're not gonna be able to motivate them to do better. 
He knows he's using the N-word, but in the process, he's making good out of it. To him, it's more important because the good outweighs the bad. Another controversy T.I. was involved in was regarding the amount of media attention he received after the unfortunate killing of his best friend, Philon Johnson. Some residents of Atlanta thought the incident received too much coverage. T.I. is just another young thug who's a poor role model. His antics are in news and stories about him have no place in the newspaper, much less on the Sunday front page. One woman said, the AJC has played this up like he's a national leader. I'm sorry the man got killed, but look who he was and who he hung out with. How come this gets so much play? She also said that she had to dig deep into the newspaper to learn what her congressman had to say about the illegal immigration. She feels newspaper and other media spend too much time covering entertainers and musicians. I'm in LA and you know I ain't gonna even put out numbers. People got killed last night, the night before, best friends, mother, kids, and like just because he a rapper they blew it up. But people out here having mad, mad car washes, homie, mad, mad car washes to bury somebody. So it's like a rapper getting all that plant, all that publicity and all that, because somebody got murked that he know, homie better bury that dude do what's right because homie, we hungry out here. We can't even afford to bury some people. We losing our best friends, so they gave it way too much. For real, they could throw something to the ghetto about these kids getting killed before they go to a rapper losing somebody. I think T.I. best friend, Philon Johnson, I think he deserved the media attention. And I know people die every day, but it's like, it, it probably helped slow down the violence and everything, because T.I., he's like, he's this big, big time artist. So, it probably helped people slow stuff down because it's getting serious out here. It doesn't surprise me that the friend of a rapper gets media attention while a lot of people go, a lot of people's death go ignored. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an entertainment culture. And if you're attached to a name that's big in entertainment, you know, you'll get that, that kind of coverage. So it doesn't really surprise me. These complaints were nothing new to Sonya Murray, who's covered pop music for the AJC for over 10 years. She said, hip hop is a billion dollar industry, and many of those artists and producers call Atlanta home. To her, it's a huge mistake for newspapers to ignore the industry and its impact. Murray's front page story in the Sunday paper of the AJC about Philon Johnson's untimely death drew a range of emotions from readers. One man left her a hateful phone message that included several references to the M-word. On the positive, an employee of the Monastery of the Holy Spirit in Conyers called offering to provide advice and spiritual counseling to T.I. Of course, newspapers isn't just about covering news. It's about selling papers. News about celebrities always gets the attention of readers. Photographs with Murray's Sunday story drew 142,000 page views on AJC.com, and those from Johnson's funeral drew 134,000. Murray defended her paper's decision in telling Johnson's story. She considers him a role model. He was working hard at his dream and enjoying the fruits of his labor. He was also a loving father, a devoted son, and a loyal friend to T.I. Still, Murray admitted that her newspaper probably did go too far in writing about his funeral in so much detail. She felt the paper didn't need to post Johnson's funeral program on their website. Johnson's death was another incident in a string of violent attacks surrounding rap artists. Murray felt these attacks are less about the lyrics and more about jealousy and the bleak conditions facing young people in poor neighborhoods. She said that hip hop grew out of hopeless situations. It's a weird tug of war. A lot of artists come out of those situations and only feel legitimate if they go back to them to perform. Sometimes the people who didn't make it out aren't happy that you did. Even if Johnson's murder wasn't associated with a popular rap artist, Murray claims she would have been interested in his story because she was so deeply disturbed by the number of young black men who are murdered each year in this country. She said their stories rarely get the attention that Johnson's did, and that breaks her heart. She wants her newspaper to devote more attention to addressing why so many black people are dying. Regardless of the media attention, a good man was lost.
T.I. is a true hero. He has used his fame and fortune to help the less fortunate. T.I. spent his Labor Day in 2005 getting involved in relief efforts to aid Hurricane Katrina victims. He took to the airwaves on Atlanta's popular station, V103 FM, for over seven hours. He asked listeners to lend their support to those who lost everything in one of the nation's worst natural disasters. T.I. showed his support by donating $50,000 and by raising over $263,000. The proceeds went to Mississippi-based producer-slash-rapper David Banner's Heal the Hood Foundation. But he didn't stop there. He also teamed up with Banner and famed musician Young Jeezy for a food and clothing drive. They asked participants to donate clothing, non-perishable foods and drinks, children's toys and games, and battery-included radios and flashlights. In April 2006, T.I. teamed up with It's Cool to Be Smart Single Parent Initiative to talk to over 150 youths at the Paulding Detention Center in Atlanta, Georgia. His goal was to provide hope to the young teens at the detention center. He answered questions about the importance of education and his success in the music industry. This wasn't the first time T.I. helped out kids. In the past, he, along with Grand Hustle Management and Atlantic Records, have helped provide scholarships to single-parent families at the Boys and Girls Clubs. In June 2005, T.I. was recognized for his charity work. The Lisa Left Eye Lopez Foundation, which was named after the deceased member of the multi-platinum female group TLC and Atlanta's famed radio station V103 FM, honored T.I. with the 2005 Lisa Lopez Award for groundbreaking achievements in music and community service. On Thursday night, June 1, 2006, T.I. and opener Young Jock lived every performer's dream. They played two shows for the toughest crowd at the legendary Apollo Theater. And what a performance they gave. T.I. started the second show of the night standing in the middle of the stage wearing a bathing ape's hooded sweatshirt, orange shorts, and matching sneakers. And the accessory to every outfit, a Louis Vuitton backpack. When the music for King began, T.I. removed his hood to reveal his face, and the crowd went wild. With DJ drama on the turntables, T.I. was constantly on the go. He ran around the stage during Top Back, Rubber Band Man, Motivation, and ASAP. Of course, some of the ladies in the front row just couldn't help themselves. They grabbed at T.I. when he rapped in their section during 24s. He then showed them his appreciation by swinging some of those sweet melodies that appeal to women, such as Freak Though, Let's Get Away, and Why You Wanna. And in Apollo tradition, the audience sang right along. But there were also some serious moments. T.I. asked the crowd to hold their cell phones in the air and let the light shine. He then talked about those people who weren't there because they were either deceased or in prison. One of those peoples was best friend, Vilant Johnson, who was killed in a shootout two months earlier. Of course, all good shows have to come to an end. T.I. ended the show with his mega hits, Bring Em Out and What You Know. T.I.'s music may be keeping him busy, but that hasn't interfered with his love life. The rap star has four children with three different women. His fourth child with escape singer Tiny has inspired his fourth album, King. T.I. and Tiny may have been together long enough to produce a child, but in March of 2006, the duo called off their wedding. Too bad, it seemed like true love. The pair started dating years before T.I. blew up. Tiny even threw T.I. a private party at one of Atlanta's naughtiest strip clubs. But T.I. didn't spend too much time consoling his broken heart. He was linked to Flavor of Love winner, Hoops, of the VH1 reality show. When Kendra G of Chicago's Power 92 morning radio show asked Hoops about her alleged love affair with T.I., Hoops said they were just friends. Not so. According to an anonymous Atlanta woman, she claimed to have engaged in a three-way with T.I. and Hoops. The woman, 
who has danced in many popular hip-hop music videos, claims she met the two in April of 2006 at an Atlanta nightclub. She said Hoops was trying to pick her up, and when the club was ready to close, T.I. invited both ladies to an after party at his mansion, where a marathon sex session lasted for over two hours. True or false? Only T.I. knows for sure. One thing is definitely true. T.I. has no problem getting the ladies. People may know T.I. for releasing one hit after another, but he's not just another rapper. He's also a businessman through and through. In 2005 alone, T.I. founded his own film production company, Grand Hustle Films, signed a multi-artist joint venture deal for his label with Atlantic Records, and established a music publishing deal with Grand Hustle Music with Morneau Chappelle. That same year, he also co-executive produced the soundtrack to the Oscar-nominated film Hustle & Flow, and released the collection through Grand Hustle and Atlantic Records. Unrelated to entertainment, T.I. also owns a construction company called New Finish, which he runs with his uncle Quentin. They renovate, construct, and then sell new homes. In March 2006, T.I. unveiled his plans to launch a new unnamed clothing line. Now, all he needs is the right distributor to team up with. T.I. admits to not having any experience in the fashion business, but that's not going to stop him from debuting his own line. He'll give the people what he thinks they may like and what he himself likes to wear. So what should people expect from this new line? He considers his collection upscale urban, and it will be in competition with Sean John and Ralph Lauren. If his prior business endeavors are any indication, no doubt his new clothing line will be a hit. In April 2006, MTV.com put out a very important list of names. Those names were the 10 candidates who should be in the running for the greatest MCs of all time in hip hop in five to 10 years. Who were among the favorites? You guessed it, T.I. They said, King is proven to be Tip's breakout LP, solidifying the King of the South's top position in all regions. He's finally crossed over into that rare breed of hip hop pop star like Jay-Z, who is just as loved in the trap as he is on the airwaves and record stores. And the swagger is unimpeachable. I don't think anyone can really predict the longevity of an artist, uh, where the, the culture is such a throwaway, kind of here today, gone tomorrow kind of culture, mm -hmm. that uh, it would be difficult to predict. I mean, he might be the biggest in the game right now, but five, 10 years from now, uh -huh. I don't really know. He has a different, totally different style from everybody else. You talk about different things from everybody else, you know. You with the pimping, and that's what I like, so I'm with it. MTV also praised T.I. for his acting ability. They predict that the future for T.I. is definitely looking like it'll be the best of both worlds. Others also making the list are Ludacris, Kanye West, Lil Wayne, The Game, Beanie Siegel, Jadakiss, Fiddy Cent, Cameron, and Talib Kweli. This is one list definitely worth making. T.I.'s accomplished so much, what else is there left for him to do? No doubt this great artist still has a few tricks up his sleeve.